Today's webinar program, Career Coaching, an Arrow in the Quiver. Uh, my name is Josh Levitt, uh, UChicago College grad from 2010, uh, and I work with the alumni careers team uh, here at the University of Chicago in beautiful Hyde Park. Uh, thank you for, for joining us this evening. Uh, this event is actually sponsored by the University of Chicago's uh, Boston Club. Uh, so we're going to hear from leadership there. Um, and our shared goal is to create resources and programming uh, to help you and our, our fellow Maroons grow in your careers. Uh, so first, uh, before we get things going with our fabulous panelists uh, of career coaches, I uh, will turn things over to our uh, leadership from the Boston Club. Kieran. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiran Valorupali, and I graduated from Booth School of Business MBA program a long time back. Um, I'm a member of the board of directors of the University of Chicago Alumni Club of Boston, and I focus on career and mentoring aspects of alumni. I am joined here by David Ijaz of the Booth uh, Alumni Club as well. Uh, the University of Chicago Alumni Club of Boston's mission is to create opportunities for the alumni to connect, engage, and learn. We conduct educational events such as this career coaching webinar, as well as several informal fun networking events such as a monthly happy hour, volunteer activities, summer boot cruise, uh, summer Ivy League plus softball team, and the monthly book club meetings, several opportunities for the alumni to network and learn from each other. Um, as far as the topic at hand is concerned, uh, most of us do not have mentors at work. We rely on informal networks to get career advice, and we do not think of career coaching as a serious alternative. And this webinar is our attempt to make alumni aware of career coaching as one of the tools that they can utilize and uh, with the help of University of Chicago Alumni Relations and Development Office, we have put together this excellent panel of career coaches. Our panelists can talk eloquently about all aspects of career coaching, including early to mid-stage career issues, gender-based issues, and senior C-suite matters, which might require some finesse. Um, before I pass it back to Josh, I request David Ajaz to share his thoughts and his experiences. Thank you, Kieran, uh, our team, and also the Boston U Chicago and Booth Clubs. I'm an alumnus of the University of Chicago, the Booth School of Business, and a family with over 100 years of connection to the University of Chicago. Located in Boston, I am on the board of the U Chicago Club, co-president of the Booth Club, and have held management and executive roles in strategic development and execution. Personally, I've benefited from career coaching throughout my professional life cycle, and continue to learn and develop. I look forward and thank you as participants to please enjoy our speakers today and discover about career coaching. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and Kiran. Um, we are so grateful uh, that uh, you know that you've collaborated with us to put together this uh, this terrific group of uh, U Chicago alumni who have now made their careers uh, in career coaching. Uh, I will let each of them uh, introduce themselves uh, and how, how they arrived at career coaching from the University of Chicago. Uh, so let's start with, with Caroline. Wonderful, welcome. So I, um, hi, I'm Caroline Auerkirk. Um, I graduated from the college in 2009 with a degree in history. Um, and after receiving my master's degree at Penn, I came back to the U of C for a few years to run a research center uh, called the University of Chicago Urban Network. Um, I am married to a fellow U Chicago alum, and my brother and his wife are also U Chicago alumni. So Thanksgiving is like our own U Chicago alumni reunion. Um, I was a very involved, <laughs> um, to put it mildly, as a student leader. Um, when I was in um, college, especially at the University Community Service Center. Um, when I was there, I ran a program called the Community Service Leadership Training Corps. Um, we're not very big on short names. Um, and that was a cohort-based uh, leadership development program for undergraduates involved in community service and social justice. 
Um, and to kind of answer this question about my pro professional trajectory towards career coaching, um, I was given a lot of freedom to shape that program. And um, that entrepreneurial spirit really set me up for running my own business later. Um, also, that intersection of social impact and leadership development has been a common theme throughout my entire career. So um, most of my clients are in the social impact sector, and I run a leadership development program and community for women in social impact as, uh, as part of my business now. So through, it definitely had its start at the University of Chicago. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, David. Well, thank you for having me. I've uh, been looking forward to the opportunity to uh, be part of this. Uh, well, my UFC journey started back in the mid 90s. I was in uh, medical school here in Boston at Harvard and I was getting restless because I hadn't studied enough philosophy yet. That was my major in college. Uh, and I learned about a program that was based at the uh, UFC back in the 90s. It was funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts and it brought people at various stages of medical training to Chicago to do a PhD in a non-science area. There were also people going through uh, the law school. So there was a great community of people doing things like uh, public policy, social thought, uh, history of medicine, economics, uh, the commonality was we were studying humanities and social sciences in the world's greatest interdisciplinary university. So I came uh, to Chicago, I studied philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, and on my dissertation committee, I also had a neuropsychiatrist uh, put together with people in philosophy and social thought. So I've, I think the common thread in my work as a psychiatrist and a career coach, executive coach, has been on the power of dialogue and what great questions and great conversations can do to, uh, to impact the brain and people's mindsets, uh, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, confidence to grow as, as people. Uh, and that includes growing in, in our uh, careers. So uh, career coaching in my mind is transformational. My experience at Chicago, being able to integrate uh, psychiatry, philosophy, uh, and a variety of other areas really kind of was the launching pad for me to be able to uh, become a coach, which I've been doing for well over a, a decade now. Built my own, uh, built my own company. Thank you. I, I, I hope we can further demonstrate the transformative power of dialogue in this conversation tonight. <laughs> uh, Marge, I'd love to hear uh, your your journey to career coaching. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Josh, and thank you, uh, everyone, for, for joining us here today. So I'm Mar Jang, and I, too, am a Booth grad. I graduated from Booth many moons ago, and um, I am now a certified executive coach um, focused on leadership development coaching and uh, career management, career pivots in particular. My background, uh, I have a 20-year marketing uh, career background uh, coming from the tech world, mostly. I've been uh, coaching and mentoring teams and professionals throughout my corporate career, uh, business career, and worked for a number of Fortune 500 firms as well as startups, um, pivoted many times in my own career. And I'm a bit of a self-confessed kind of a career nerd. Uh, that combined with the multiple pivots that I've made in my career led to this passion for career coaching. Um, I just really enjoy and super passionate about helping teams and individuals get to that transformational point, just seeing their faces light up. That's joy and fulfillment for me. And um, so I uh, focus and specialize on career pivots, um, really passionate about helping people build resilient careers and uh, stay adaptable in this fast changing world as you've seen what's happened in the last few years. Um, I'm also currently an executive coach at the UCLA Professional MBA program. So happy to be here and join the dialogue today. Well, as a, as a fellow career nerd, you are definitely among friends. Uh, now, I learned that like modern career coaching actually stretches back to like the early 20th century with the landmark publication of this book uh, in 1909 called Choosing a Vocation. Uh, it was by uh, the, the director of Boston's Vocation Bureau. 
And anyway, it, rep it represent the book represented a shift um, from an occupation, something you do, to a vocation, right? So that uh, something that has has to do with suitability, uh, both with your both personally and with respect to the, the skill set. Uh, the author of that, his name's uh, Frank Parsons. You can look this up on Google Books. He had two paradigms. One was the personal investigation and then the other, the industrial investigation in terms of looking within and then looking out in different career fields. That leads me to our kind of first basic yet complex question for you as career coaches, given, the, given this history, like what is career coaching? What distinguishes your coaching practice and who is it designed for? Uh, so let's hear, how about uh, Caroline, you wanna start us off? Sure thing, so I love this. Um, as a historian, I appreciate the, um, the context. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so what is career coaching? So I, um, I work um, primarily with high achievers who are, uh, I mean, many of them are U Chicago alumni. I think 75% of my clients are U Chicago alumni. So thank you um, for being here. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed about, um, about high achievers in particular is this transition from um, having spent your, um, your entire experience to date, um, doing all of the things that you're supposed to be doing, um, and then kind of hitting this point somewhere after um, a couple of years after you finish school, where you're starting to realize that um, just because you're good at something doesn't mean you necessarily like doing it. Um, and you start, and, and so a lot of the folks that I talk with are in this space of career discernment, where they're trying to figure out what it is that they actually like to, go, to do and are good at. Um, and I think when I think about career coaching, I think about it as developing the framework from which you can make decisions you feel confident in. Um, because a lot of us have, um, have spent our lives doing the thing we were supposed to do. Um, I'm gonna name that. I mean, I've spent a lot of my life <laughs> to date doing the thing I was supposed to do. And um, I think that we need to create space for that discernment of figuring out um, what it is that you are good at and like to do and giving permission to not do the things that you don't like doing, even if you're good at them, right? Um, I often, um, you know, share the, the story of my first, uh, my first job out of college where I was running this research center out of grad school, out of running a research center where I was, um, one of my many responsibilities was organizing conferences. And I am a phenomenal conference organizer. I am really good at attention to detail. I am, you know, all of the things, but um, I realized that it was just not for me. Um, and I decided to, to move away from that, right? And stop doing that um, because I really wanted to focus more on my strengths. Um, I am a strengths-based coach. So I'm trained in the Gallup Clifton Strengths Finder assessment. And um, I use that with almost all of my clients to really create this, um, this uh, strengths-based um, uh, framework from which you can make decisions about um, what is a good match for your, for your skills and priorities. Um, so in terms of, you know, to, to sort of come back to this question of what is career coaching, right? It's this framework building, it's thinking about this um, alignment of your values, your strengths, your priorities. Um, I also think about it as, um, as feeling confident in the decisions that you're making, right? So understanding why you're choosing to go in a particular, particular direction when you may not have had the time or space to ask yourself those questions before. And then in terms of my own practice, I focus on kind of two groups of people. One is uh, social impact professionals. So people who are in the social impact space, whether that's for-profit or nonprofit. So CSR professionals and um, nonprofit professionals. And then um, I spent the first uh, 10 years of my career working in higher education. So I have a really strong um, soft spot for uh, earlier career professionals who are uh, trying to figure out what they wanna do. Fantastic. The, the great working definition, as we would say <laughs> in, in our Chicago class. Uh, Marge, how about you? What is career coaching to your mind? Um, and what distinguishes your practice? Who is it for? 
Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think holistically, so I'll address kind of holistically and, and Carolyn addressed many of the sort of most important kind of the essence of career coaching. But in bigger picture, um, sometimes, you know, people are stuck uh, making a decision, they need clarity, or they just need a confidence boost. They're not sure if they're doing the right things, or are they applying to the right jobs, are they even seeking the right career path, and they just need kind of any, any of those three. So having a coach is like um, uh, being a, a bit of a, like a mirror, I call it, you know, somebody who can be objective and, um, you know, be a sounding board, be a guide. Uh, sometimes people, clients come to me wanting a recipe, like, just tell me what to do. And that's not really what coaching is. Coaching is more about guiding their thought process. You know, I'm the co-pilot, you're in the pilot seat, you're, you're flying the plane. So it's really all about, you know, I'm just here to guide you. You have all the answers. I'm just pulling it out of you. So it's that kind of, um, uh, I call it a co-active arrangement. You know, we're working together to create something here and it's really all about the client. So um, whether it's navigating your own kind of career path, um, you know, positioning yourself for advancement, branding yourself, um, navigating corporate life, working with your difficult boss or difficult team. So all of the above, think encompass coaching and the latter half of that is leadership development also. So it's how you show up at work, how you show up in your personal life, you know, everything bleeds into each other now, life and work and career. So all of that blended together and um, going through your own inner journey to become kind of and, and realize your most authentic self and bring that to, to your work and your life. So that's what coaches, my coaching practice mostly focuses on. Um, and I actually work with, my practice is focused on women in tech because that's my sweet spot. That's the world I come from. But um, I do get clients uh, all over the spectrum, different professions and different levels. Uh, some are early professional, middle, and also more senior executives. So just a, a really wide range of clients. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. I'm curious to hear how, it, how do you define career coaching? Well, I'll start out with the Frank Parsons book, which I think is a great reference. Uh, but what I'll, I'll, I'll take the origin of uh, career coaching back a few, so multiple, many centuries, many, many centuries back to uh, fifth century ancient Greece and Socrates and the Socratic dialogue, which was all about asking powerful questions and um, getting uh, the person you're having a discussion with deeply engaged in uh, thinking about and conversations about core values and what's beauty and what's truth and you know what what matters in the world. So uh, my approach to coaching is is very dialogue focused, as I was mentioning before. The greatest indicator to me that a coaching session is going well is that I've asked an open-ended question, not something with a yes or no answer or a leading question or something that's really a suggestion, um, uh, masquerading as a question but a question that makes the person I'm coaching kind of stop and put their head back and say, that's a really great question. I hadn't thought of that before, or that's a different perspective. Uh, and so when I see the client I'm working with kind of step back uh, and, and do some thinking and the wheels start turning, what, what's happening there is a self-discovery process. The coach is a facilitator. And, Forget exactly how you said it, Marge, but I think you said some, uh, something about um, I'm helping helping get it get uh, get the ideas out of the client. And Socrates is often defined as a midwife, right? He was helping give birth to uh, to a new way of doing things, a new way of seeing things, a new person, a new a new career. So, uh, and th this is what's I think a little bit different, and we may talk about this later. Different about coaching than career consulting. A career consultant may come in and do a battery of tests and say, you should be working in software development or you know, you would really hate working in an uh, operations-based job. You need to be doing something more creative or stay away from Fortune 500 companies. You're an entrepreneur. Coaches like us can talk about those things, but we're more focused on asking questions and promoting a, a self-discovery process. Sometimes we'll bring that other data in 
from assessments in their career consulting world. But I think that's one of the things um, that I think about in my practice and that many coaches, the coaching model is all about is asking the right questions and, and fostering uh, insight and dialogue. Flash poll for attendees who thought that Socrates was going to come up in this, uh, but right, but that's exactly the the core skill you know that you know that we are learning here uh, is how is how to ask those questions in that same classical way, uh, and and it's really from there that career coaching has become that recognizable profession unto itself with its own set of specialties and methodologies. Now, the three of you spoke a lot about um, what career coaching is. Marge, and you were sharing also what career coaching isn't, right? Uh, so I also uh, would like to know in your experience, you know, what is the number one misconception about career coaching? Where do you think it comes from? And like, how do you dispel this idea? Um, so Marge, since, since you started us off there, um, uh, could you tell us some more? What, what do you think is that number one misconception? Where does it come from and how do you dispel it? Yeah, there, there are several. The, the one I'll hit on, uh, continuing on what, what I mentioned earlier about um, people think about career coaches as just resumes and cover letters and you know, but that, that is a tiny, tiny part of, of what I do. I'll speak about my own practice as a career coach. Um, so much of it is more about inner journey and self-awareness, as, as David mentioned as well. So it's, I always start with, with that, with my clients, because um, oftentimes people just want the recipe, you know, just tell me what job, tell me how I do my resume, write my resume for me, you know, and, and that's, just way down the line, you know, they need to start kind of higher level. What is it, you know, who are they, you know, beyond just what they're good at, it's also what are they passionate about? It's the what can they do, what will they do, and how is the culture match going to work for them as, as their own individuals? So it's matching up all that. And, you know, some people are not just not that very aware, or have done that inner journey work. And that's, a bulk of what I do as a, as a coach is to help make sure clients are aware of that. You know, um, some of the work that we do involves uh, working with your saboteurs. So <laughs> career searching can be very isolating, just like entrepreneurship, as, as you may bring up later on. Uh, and, and often it's just you and your saboteurs, your gremlins talking to each other. So it's important to have a support network and a support group, a community, your board of advisors, such as a coach, to help you um, get out of that and get out of your kind of um, uh, mindset and just shift your perspective a little bit so you can get past that. So it certainly isn't advice giving. It's it's more about um, pulling the answers, realigning you with your own kind of who you are and what's important to you. I love that. I love that that sense of of both like introspection, alignment, um, and then also as you said, it's also not totally isolated either. That it includes a, a circle of support or a board of advisors, um, as well, really to uh, to make the most of it. Caroline, I don't know your your practice also takes a very like introspective and holistic approach. Um, so based on that, like, what do you find is that is that number one misconception about career coaching? So I, I mean, I agree with, with Marge around the number one um, challenge being um, clients who want to be told what they should do. And I think should is an incredibly dangerous word. Um, there's a book I recommend frequently to folks um, called The Crossroads of Should and Must. Um, and it's, it's illustrated, if that helps, um, but it is a, a really amazing book about this, this process of figuring out what is it that you feel called to do um, to your earlier point about this, about vocation and, um, you know, coming from the Latin voco vocare, right? Um, we can, we can incorporate all the Chicago uh, <laughs> stuff into this, but, um, but, but to that end, I, I really appreciated this question that you asked about where does it come from? And my philosophy around where this comes from is, is that we, is this shift that we all need to go through um, from what I call rote learning, right? Where you are mastering curriculum, you're mastering material, you're 
you're showing up to class and you get a syllabus and you're, you have this promise that if you do all these things, um, then you'll get these learning outcomes by the end of it. And that's how we spend our entire educational experiences. And then you get thrown into the post, um, post educational world, right? Where um, we're learning from lived experience and not many of us have a lot of opportunity to practice uh, experiential learning. Um, and experiential learning is meaning making from lived experience. And one of the most amazing things about coaching, in my opinion, is, is, that, is creating that space to make meaning from experience. Um, and this is also to Marge's point around the um, holding up the mirror and giving you the space to process um, and David's point around the conversation and, and the power of dialogue. Um, we don't we don't learn that um, touching a hot stove is going to burn us. We learn from touching the stove and then thinking about why we got burned, right? And then deciding to do something differently the next time, right? This is the, the crux of experiential learning. Um, and especially for high achievers where you spend your entire um, experience uh, getting the right answer, progressing the way you're supposed to, um, it can be incredibly overwhelming to graduate uh, from all these amazing schools and then and then be like, now what, right? What do I do next? What, how do I know that I'm on the right track, right? And, and um, I was there, right? This is the reason why I have like a million degrees and certificates from the time I graduated from the University of Chicago to when I, to, to now. I mean, I, I still, I'm still collecting it, right? But now I've embraced it as a feature of my, um, my, my, con my learner strength um, from the strengths finder assessment and less of my achiever kind of constantly leaping hurdles. Um, but I just think that that's such a really important distinction. And so one of the most powerful things that I think we can do in coaching is create that space to trust your own lived experience and realize that you're the authority of your own life. And you have the power to take the same set of facts and make whatever narrative you want to, right? Um, there are people who believe that the world is flat and they're looking at the same set of data we are, right? And so why can't you look at this data and decide that you that success is inevitable, right? Or that you can do all kinds of different things, right? It's about constructing the narrative and, and connecting the dots of your life in the way that makes sense to you. I, I often like to tell clients that um, the dots are a straight line because they're your dots, right? They only start, you only start going off the path if you're comparing yourself to other people, but um, this is not the game of life. Um, we are making the road by walking. We are not trying to get to, um, you know, to the end of the board game, right? Um, and I think that that's a really powerful um, opportunity that we have within coaching to create this space for us to, um, to, to embrace that and to, and to realize that we are in control of that, of that process. So you are the authority on your own life and you can become the author. Uh, they, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, do you find that there's, there's a misconception around, around that? Oh yeah, I mean, I think that, that I mean, yes. And the, and the last thing I'll say, cause I'm sure David's got some really great stuff to contribute to this is that um, you, that you are in you there are, there are so many misconceptions around feeling like you're starting from scratch right but learning is experiential and iterative you're never starting from scratch like you're always you're always iterating and i think that that's the most beautiful thing but when you come from this high achieving paradigm where like you didn't get through the university of chicago by failing right you you got through by 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 getting through right and so um it's really embracing this opportunity for, um, you know, controlled risk taking, right? For um, experimentation, for reflect reflection on lived experience, for iterating. And um, in my, I just, I just um, updated my website, and one of the things that I wrote was, you know, get out of your head and into a job you love, because um, I think another big misconception is that you can figure this out all by yourself, um, and the answers are certainly with inside you, you know, and David can probably speak to this even more than I can, but, um, but you can't have that conversation with yourself very effectively, I have found, right? You're gonna get, you're gonna get a lot farther, a lot faster if you actually partner with someone. And in many cases, it's a great idea not to do that with your partner, parent, or um, best friend, because um, you need that objective voice. 
I, I, I resonate with everything Caroline and, um, and Marge said. I, the way I might summarize the misconception is that career coaching is about your career. Uh, because it is, but it's, it's really about so, so much more than that. Your career is one part of your life. And I think as career coaches, we're looking more you know, holistically uh, at the person that we're, that we're talking to and contextualizing the, the career. Uh, but the other famous Socrates saying is know thyself. And I, I think both uh, Caroline and Marge have also uh, referred to that. It's, it's about asking the right questions to develop self-awareness and to um, find a new way to navigate your entire life. Well, when career coaching goes well, people tell me all of my relationships are better. I'm getting along better at home with my, my spouse or partner. I have a better relationship with my kids. I figured out how to talk to people. I figured out how to ask them questions rather than bark at them. So and we live in a very career oriented um, society. Uh, and people coming out of U of C, you know, high, high powered, career oriented, of course. Uh, and oftentimes I find career coaching is kind of a good way to allow yourself into this. It's like, oh, this is part of my job, but what it's really about, it's not psychotherapy. We can also talk about those distinctions, but uh, it, it is getting into a relationship with somebody and a discussion, as Caroline said, outside your own head many different inputs, mental inputs, different neural inputs uh, that, that broaden how, how you think about things and re really uh, help people take more responsibility, ownership, agency um, for their entire life. So it's only, it's only a little bit about your career. That's, that's important, but it's, it goes way beyond that. I love that. Josh, yeah. I, I'm sorry to, to pull the, the the classic challenge with the panel of, of interrupting, but I want to add one more thing that David just reminded me of, which is um, you are not a Barbie doll. Um, and I think that that's another misconception of career coaching, which is that there is a certain number of jobs that are out there. And this is a process of, elim of elimination test to pick the right one for you. Um, but in reality, there are so many more jobs out there than any of us can even imagine. Um, and, um, and I think that that's so cool. But I would also say that at least my experience at the University of Chicago, I, I, I graduated thinking that there were like five jobs, right? Doctor, lawyer, business person, professor, or um, engineer. Um, that's only because my father is an engineer. Um, we didn't have that, right? Um, and I think uh, that's a really hard paradigm to get out of. Um, but if you think about it, there are tons of jobs, right? I learned recently that there's a um, disaster response team at the Library of Congress. Right, so this is a beautiful intersection of things that I never thought would be, you know, in a, in a job um, at the same job, <laughs> um, and and you can find an intersection of that in pretty much any um, any intersection. That's like one of my favorite hobbies is to think of the jobs that we haven't thought of yet. Right, so bowling ball man, uh, designer among others. Right, so I just want to offer that as well. Fantastic. Uh, I I want to move things now from the realm of theory to the realm of practice. So. <laughs> uh, I think this will be a fun challenge. Tell us an illuminating story from your career as a career coach. What did you and your client learn from the experience? Uh, Marge, I remember you, you were, were sharing some stories when we were talking the other day. Yeah, um, the one um, thing that stands out in my mind is um, the way uh, David alluded to it earlier is how career pathing or management is all about mindset. So one of the things that one of my clients shared with me, she said, um, you know, she says, wow, I didn't realize I could rewrite my own narrative, you know, and just that radical self-acceptance of herself and who she is, is totally okay. So that's something that came out of the work that we did together. And to me, I thought, oh, she came up with that herself. You know, I just asked the questions, and I'm glad that the questions led somewhere and led her to that conclusion. So, I mean, it sounds, you know, but that, that's, that's really for me the most illuminating when, when a client actually says that and articulates that themselves. You know, it's like um, just, the, this is the reason I coach. <laughs> that's why I wanna put up on my wall. That's the reason I coach. And so just 
taking clients through that whole process from self-awareness, knowing thyself, um, that discovery and that self-acceptance. You know, um, we talk about, you know, we're all high achievers. We all went to University of Chicago. And a lot of times there's that, you know, we, we work so hard, but it feels like we're not doing enough, you know, and that's because we're so focused on the achieving and not the just being. And that's something that the same client actually came to the realization of, you know, it's just being herself and being okay with that is, is sounds very simple, but it's really hard to get there and grasp. So to me, that was um, pretty illuminating. Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, David, what, tell, tell us a story. Yeah, well, I, I love Marge's story. It, it called to mind uh, uh, a client that I worked with a couple of years ago. Uh, she was a wonderful attorney in a financial services firm and she was in a regulatory sort of compliance role. Uh, and extremely hardworking, well-respected. Uh, they wanted to promote her, but they didn't. And that was because she just was not getting along with certain uh, people on the business side uh, who would come to her uh, with new ideas for different kinds of products and solutions for clients. And it was usually the prototypical answer from a lawyer, no, and you know, here's all the reasons why. So we teased out in the mindset, uh, she had this idea, I'm the protector of the firm. And the, the safest and best thing for me to do is say no to anything where there's anything more than minimal risk. Uh, and so people would come to her with these new ideas and she'd get irritable and she'd roll her eyes and she'd get frustrated. And they started avoiding her and saying, don't promote her. Uh, but they wanted to, the company wanted to promote her. So that was where uh, coaching was identified as let's, let's give it six months and see if she can pivot into a new way of doing things. Uh, and we did a lot of mindset work and what she came around to realizing through both questions and my observations uh, was I'm not the protector of the firm. I'm here to be a support. I'm here to bring my expertise on regulations, on the SEC, that, uh, all of that. I'm not here to say no or decide. I'm here to consult and have a dialogue. So she, uh, she summarized in her head, I'm not the protector of the firm. I'm a thought partner with legal expertise. And that shift to I'm a thought partner led to just a cascade of behavioral changes. Mm -hmm. She didn't have social skills deficits. She got along with people in just every area of her life except this one area where she was kind of clenched and clamping down on what was happening. So I think again, just as Marge was saying, just be yourself. You're, you know, you're a wonderful, socially skilled, likable person. Just relax into the role and have a different conception of what you're doing. So then she didn't need to be coached on every little thing. Don't roll your eyes in meetings. Don't, you know, don't go red in the face. Um, she just had to think differently. Uh, and uh, it's just a wonderful story. I, you know, the coaching ended and then I heard from her six months later and we got together for a celebratory cup of coffee. She, she got the promotion. So it's always nice to see a very specific uh, outcome like that. But that was a story that really uh, in inspired me. Uh, it was just such a privilege to, to work with her and see one sentence that changed in her head over the course of the coaching uh, led to um, you know, a brilliant ca career um, skyrocketing. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, Caroline, do you also you have a I know like you've you've shared a few stories along those lines. Um what's what's your go-to? So I really struggled with this question in the prep, um, to be honest. And I I finally so I have lots of really great stories. I had two clients get jobs uh this week, which is super exciting. I have, you know, I have an amazing client who didn't think that grad school was gonna be possible and then ended up, you know, going off to the London School of Economics all amazing stuff. But I think the most illuminating story that I think of um, is actually one of failure, right? Um, or not a good match. And I think that that's a really important uh, conversation to have here as well, which is um, last year when I had a client who, um, who was just not interested in doing the work, right? So he had paid, right? He was showing up to the sessions, but he wasn't, he wasn't um, interested in 
in the, any of the introspective kind of conversation or, um, or um, the, the creating the space to explore possibilities. He really wanted to focus on what, you know, just tell me what I should be doing, right? And was getting really frustrated with that, uh, that opportunity to ask questions and to explore and, and, and have uh, entertain possibilities. Um, and I eventually had to, had to, you know, end the, the coaching relationship because um, it was just, he just wasn't ready to engage in the conversation um, and to think about it as, a, as a, an opportunity for growth. Um, and I think that that's a really illuminating, illuminating story because I think it doesn't just work if you just show up, right? You have to, you have to um, you know, take the time to engage with it and to trust the process, right? Um, I've, had the, I've had the privilege of working with a lot of people um, and, and trusting the process is really, really important um, and understanding that there's, there's an opportunity for growth there. Um, and, um, and I just think that that's really, really key um, to believe that it's gonna work, right? Um, I've had, had a, I had another client who, um, who just, who wanted, to, who wanted to plan one session at a time, right? And kind of re-up his, you know, his uh, coaching experience sort of, and, and sort of do it piecemeal. Um, and I, and I declined because, um, to me that indicated that he was going to, to take a pause every single time and reassess whether he wanted to, to continue, you know, to continue or to have that conversation. And there wasn't, he wasn't allowing for it to work. He was looking for ways that it wasn't going to work. And, um, and that it's, we notice what we're looking for, right? So if we believe something isn't going to work, then we're going to look for the evidence that supports that. If we believe something is working, um, we'll, we'll see our, our mindset shift over time. Fantastic. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate not only to have the three of you uh, with such like such a wealth of, of expertise um, and, this and, and depth of thought, um, but also, this is an opportunity for us to engage, you know, with with you as entrepreneurs, right? You're all entrepreneurs. You've served on entrepreneurs, whether they're established or just starting out. Um, one one question that, that came in beforehand um, was, how does coaching enable entrepreneurs to harness their entrepreneurship, um, both both your own and your um, and your clients? Uh, David, how about let's start with you on that one. I, I love working with entrepreneurs that are starting new businesses or entrepreneurs who <clears throat> found themselves stuck in a corporate role where they can't be entrepreneurial anymore, or at least don't think they can. And then we either work on <laughs> how, to, how to bring more of an entrepreneurial spirit and a set of roles into the job or go, go somewhere else, make a, make a transition. Uh, 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 in general, entrepreneurs are like other people. When they when they come into coaching, it's important to really you know, for the coach to really listen to what drives them, what are their motivators, uh, core values. I, I I work with somebody who's you know he wants to um, uh, make sure that every single person in the world is screened for a certain kind of cancer, uh, and at a young age, he's he's made significant strides in that direction and the thing that gets him out of bed each morning and the thing that gets him to learn all the skills. I mean, coach can't teach every, every single skill that you need about how to set up, a, set up an LLC or do this or do that as an entrepreneur, it can help. But uh, the, the main thing is connecting with the values uh, and uh, part of the coaching with this person I'm talking about is how do you offload things that are getting in the way of your getting um, your entrepreneurial venture off the ground? Uh, and some of it, some of the questions are like, well, how does that serve the purpose of getting every person in the world in the next 20 years screened for that cancer? It's not, it doesn't. Then get rid of it. Uh, and uh, you know, it becomes like a pruning uh, the rose bush. What about this other thing? How important is that? Oh, that's really important. How many hours did you spend on it last week? A half hour. Why aren't you spending 30 hours on it? Yeah. I'm not giving a suggestion that it should be 30 hours, but I'm provoking some thinking and discussion about how an entrepreneur can move away from the things that are distractions or draining of energy. One of my favorite questions is, what, what gives you more energy? 
does that do interact does interacting with that person or doing that task raise your energy level or deplete you if it raises your energy level you're probably on the right track uh, so that's that's at least some perspective on how I you know like to in, engage with entrepreneurs. What are the core values and what gives you energy? Yeah, and Marge, I know you right. You work with also like a, a special set, right? A specialized set of entrepreneurs um, in your work. How um, how do you apply you know David's principles? What you know what seems to come up in your practice? Yeah, I think. Uh, I you know, building on what David mentioned, much of the similar uh, qualities, uh, I think certain amount of fearlessness. So it um, working with entrepreneurs to, to kind of get out of their own way. So working with their saboteurs, and, and once again, the subject of, you know, their gremlins and maintaining kind of a, um, um, I went through this training called positive intelligence, and it's really understanding what your saboteurs are and um, working through them you know, because they're always going to be there. So how do you work through them? Even things like, you know, high being very, I'm a super high achiever myself. That was one of my saboteurs. So working through that, it's not going to go away, but how do I manage that and work with it so it doesn't get in my way as an entrepreneur? So many of my clients are in a similar boat. Um, so helping them harness, uh, manage that. And um, looking at things, speaking of mindset, you know, the abundance mindset versus scarce mindset, right? So it's like, where are the opportunities here? You know, every time you fail, what do you learn? What's the opportunity? What's the gift here? And it's not about false positivity. It's more about really looking at it as, okay, what is this telling me? What are the indicators here? Take it as a data point, as I come from the tech world. What is this data telling me and what's the next step? To where, where do I go from here? So taking it as that rather than failure per se, you know, so, so not being afraid to just keep trying new things and experimenting and, and just iterating. Yeah. That's it. And, and Caroline, one of your clients started a hot sauce company. Yeah. And so I, I, I know we have a lot, uh, a lot of other stuff we want to talk about. So I, I'm just going to actually drop, I dropped the hot sauce company into the chat. And then I'm also mentioning a podcast. Um, where one of my clients started the podcast as a way to test out her entrepreneurial journey. She just started her own coach, uh, consulting business uh, uh, two months ago. Um, and she invited me to speak on her podcast. So I just dropped the link to that as well um, because um, we talk about entrepreneurship and starting your own business in, um, in the podcast as well. Um, I used to teach entrepreneurship classes, so I love talking about this, but um, I want to make sure we have time to talk about some of the other questions that I know we've got on our, on our list. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That is so uh, terrific. We have had uh, some questions coming in through the Q and A. Um, I'd like to actually address some of those are uh, phenomenal. Uh, so one asks like, you know, we've taught so much about, um, really about introspection and so on, um, as part of the, that core, like that core skill foundational to, um, to it really finding fulfillment and advancement in your career. But where do you draw the distinction between life and career coaching? Given, as we, I think mentioned at the beginning that we live in a culture where work and life really seems to be blurring together, um, including even in the spaces where we work. Uh, so how, how do you draw that distinction between life coaching and career coaching? Or don't you, <laughs> uh, in, in some respects? Uh, so let's see, uh, David, you wanna start us off there? There's a lot of overlap between career and, and life coaching. It's a lot, I, I think if we were having a life coaching discussion, we'd be saying a lot of the same things that we're saying now, but there, there are important distinctions. Uh, career, career coaching, the leading edge of the discussion and the main goal is around work life, success in the workplace, um, finding your passion uh, for, uh, for career success and you know, whatever your motivators are screening the whole world for cancer or making enough money to send your kids to college, you know, whatever the motivators are, it's, it's, for, it's focused on work. Uh, life coaching is a bit more focused on um, keeping your apartment organized uh, or uh, building on certain kind of personal relationships that, that have been 
that have been difficult making a decision about you know whether to get married or not. Uh, it, it's a bit more. It's it's a bit more on the personal psychotherapy um, spectrum um, uh, of coaching. So I think that's the main distinction. Is the leading edge is about work and, and career. But many of the principles that we've been talking about about self discovery, self awareness, uh, dialogue, digging deep, um, making behavioral changes for success are, are really very similar. Yeah, thank you. I, I, yeah, I definitely wanted to get your your insight. Um, having worked in psychology and therapy, I know um, we had some questions come in along those lines as well. So thank you for for speaking to that. Uh, yeah, Marge, how do you like distinguish between life and career coaching? Yeah, the, there actually there's a lot of overlap. So I totally agree with David, and um, you know. It goes back to when when I coach, it's coaching the whole person and uh, believing that they're naturally uh, creative and resourceful, you know, as people. So the overlap is very, it's, it's almost, it's almost always there, especially today with how we bring ourselves to work and the authenticity, you know, grabbing onto that. So I'm going to say there's a lot of overlap, but there's really almost no, you know, the boundaries really blur. And uh, so that's kind of my short answer to that. Yeah, I, that, I, I really appreciate that. Um, another question came in that um, I think, I think uh, Caroline would be great uh, to, to weigh in on. Uh, uh, one, one of our attendees asked, how do you address developing that, that gravitas for someone in a career pivot, you know, restarting at the learning level, uh, considering, um, and, you know, so say, so say you're, you know, you're going from, you know, one, just like one field to another field, one level to another level. Uh, like, how, like, how do you do that career pivot? Yes. And before you jump in, Josh, I'm going, I need to step away for 30 seconds to get a charger. I'm about to lose my battery. I thought I had the charger. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that this is a really great question. Um, so in my in my past life, I used to uh, work in urban research. And one of the topics that we talked about a lot is asset-based versus deficit-based uh, community development um, at the risk of uh, shortchanging all of these amazing um, thinkers in this space. Um, deficit-based being focusing on weaknesses and asset-based being focusing on strengths. And I think... Um, in this particular, in, in all cases, it's helpful to focus on leveraging what you've got in order to get where you want, as opposed to focusing on the gaps between where you are and what you need to, to have. Um, so how might your weaknesses be a strength? Um, and um, one of the, my favorite questions for this is this question of how might I claim that, right? So how might I, how might I claim this as opposed to for example, looking at um, a job description and using the bullet points as a, as a checklist to count yourself out, thinking about it from this approach of how might I claim this, right? Um, and really thinking about how might my deficits be leveraged as strengths. Awesome, fantastic, that's it. That's the root of that gravitas. Um, and then uh, another question before we, before we uh, wrap up, uh, really getting down to brass tacks, Quickly, what is a reasonable time frame for the type of career coaching you specialize in, and what is a reasonable rate? How long? How long will I be in career coaching, and how much will it cost me, depending? Um, so, uh, March, uh, tell us. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and there's many different ways that um, you know, and most people are probably wondering if it's something they pay for out of their own pocket. Um, and, and the good news is that many companies now are starting to offer it as a benefit. So if you're considering that um, or in a, some sort of career development discussion with your manager, for example, that might be a good time to bring this up and ask if it's something that could be covered or could be you know, taken advantage of as a benefit to you. Because uh, in this age of the great reshuffle or the great onboarding, whatever you want to call it, 
Uh, a lot of companies are realizing it's expensive to hire and retrain people when they leave. So what can they do to keep people, to keep them happy, to keep them fulfilled? So um, they're starting to offer that now as a benefit. So for people who are wondering about that, I, I thought I would go ahead and address that. Um, in terms of a time frame, it really depends on client needs. Um, I, my engagements are six to 12 sessions, or it could be in months as well. And it really depends on the client. So I, I, don't, I don't like to prescribe a time until I meet the client and get to know what their needs are. So it's generally based on that. And it's going to take, you know, a, it's over a period of time where the transformation happens. So it wouldn't just be a one or two sessions and then you're done type of thing. So it's going to take a, a certain amount of time. Yeah, uh, Carolyn, you say you work with uh, with grad students. They ever turn to you and say, "How can I ever afford this?" Um, sometimes, I mean, I uh, to Marge's point, um, this. So I, um, it is being offered more as a benefit, but I also, um, it's it is often still something you have to ask for. So it's um, asking. I, I've worked with several clients who have had who have used their professional development funding to pay for coaching. Um, I also, um, I've also seen um, this idea of negotiating leadership coaching as part of your job offer. So not necessarily career coaching, which often has this idea of how do I transition to a new career, but it can sometimes be helpful to, to call it leadership coaching um, and this idea of navigating leadership conversations and how do you want to show up as a leader. And sometimes that means exiting the company. Sometimes it means um, thinking about other ways that you can show up within the organization. Um, and then I also, I also just want to, um, uh, you know, you know, just name things of, you know, it, you have to trust the process and believe it's going to work. Um, I, and, and be willing to do the work and, and consider it to be an investment. Um, it is, uh, it is, um, it can be incredibly transformational. Um, and that is, a, that's just a really important aspect of it as well. Um, but, uh, it's, it's, um, you don't necessarily also, and also from a time perspective, I usually work with clients, um, over a, a shorter period of time, you know, six sessions over three months, that kind of thing. So we're meeting every other week to really develop a good cadence. Um, but you also don't necessarily need to do it just when you're plotting a switch. Um, you can also do it when you're, um, looking for, um, for, uh, um, just, um, going through a transition in the office. Um, I also would just mention, um, I saw that there was a, a Yelp equivalent for career coaches, not to my knowledge. Um, I think that that sounds like a great business idea to that entrepreneurship question. Um, how do you validate a coach? Um, I've, I've certainly had clients ask for references. Um, I've also, I'm in the process of updating my website for testimonials. Um, but, um, asking uh, most of my clients are for, through word of mouth, which is the best compliment I can get. But I actually haven't done much advertising other than New Chicago events where I um, I talk about what I do um, and uh, and then everything else is through word of mouth. And if you're looking for a set of fellow U Chicago alumni who are themselves career coaches, take a look in the chat. It will bring you to a directory on alumni and friends uh, that includes Caroline, uh, Marge and, and David. Um, and you can find, hopefully find a career coach uh, that works best for you. Uh, I'm gonna turn things over to wrap up. Uh, with a special thank you uh, to Kieran and David from the uh, Boston Club. So uh, welcome back. Please share, um, share next steps for connecting with the Alumni uh, Club of Boston. Thank you, Josh. Uh, fantastic webinar, lots of visual information. Uh, the Alumni Club of Boston thanks uh, Natalia, Samantha, Josh for their help in making this career coaching webinar idea a reality. We appreciate it very much. Marge, David, and Caroline, we sincerely appreciate the time and expertise you shared. A uh, big thanks to the rest of the board of directors, specifically the planning committee of uh, David Ajaz, just Fleming, Rob Sellers, as well as support of the other board of members, such as Elizabeth Wang, Sangeeta Prasad, Lee Liu, without help, we won't be able to make this happen. And most importantly, many thanks to all the attendees who attended this webinar, despite the demands on their time from their upcoming Memorial Day weekend plans, we appreciate that. Thank you for making part of the 
uh, this evening. And also last, if any of you are from Boston and surrounding area, we'd love to see you at our events so that we can build a stronger alumni community. Uh, this coming Sunday at 4.30 p.m., we have a book club event. On June 9th, we have a live music happy hour event at the parks in Boston. There's also still room on our softball team. As we mentioned earlier, we have our own softball team. And uh, you can learn a lot more about the Boston Alumni Club on Facebook or on LinkedIn. And I'm going to share uh, information on about our clubs here. If I can do the chat here. Let's see, uh, everyone. Uh, let's just all a whole bunch of lists about the University of Chicago. Uh, if you are in the neighborhood, please click on the links and please do comment, subscribe. And um, I promise there will be a lot more great career events in the future. So please subscribe and uh, stay tuned. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. Josh. I just want to say I just want to say thanks again um, for you know to the yeah. panelists for sharing uh, your your insights. Uh, University of Chicago alumni programming continues uh, throughout June and July with our signature Young Professional series. So uh, whether you or the young professionals in your life are looking for sage advice on uncommon careers, tips on interviewing as an introvert, a chance to chat with fellow young professionals. Uh, the series is here uh, to help the young professionals in our alumni community cultivate their early careers and extend it beyond. Um, thank you so much. Uh, link is there in the chat. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, you Chicago. Thank you.